see if I can unpack this message real quick. I like it. I don't know. I did actually felt uh, just a little flowy today, even as I was preparing. So uh, get ready. I, I'm in. I'm going to be in Romans one, two, and three, and I am going to talk about your identity. And my heart today, more than anything, is is that we discover, we learn, we have a better understanding of who God says that we are. You know, the the journey of identity. It's not me going and defining God. It's actually me discovering who he is. If God doesn't define me, then I'll define myself. If God doesn't define me, then I will define myself. But here's the beautiful thing. That can almost feel like this, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, sometimes when you talk about the righteousness of God, I'm going to talk about his righteousness. It almost feels like this scary thing. But the truth is, is that if we understand that we are made in the image of God and we understand who God says that we are, I actually have this little bookmark that we did when we did Birmingham Revival Group and on the back of it, there's a list here of things that the scriptures teach us who we are. And I'll just read a couple of them or more than a couple. It says, I am a new creation. You and me, we are in Christ, a new creation. We're the righteousness of God. I've been born again by the Holy Spirit. I'm saved by grace as a gift, not because of my performance. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I radiate light wherever I go, Matthew 5, 14. I am a son and daughter of light, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. Beams of light and joy exude within me, Psalms 97 11. I am a victor, Romans 8 37. I have a heavenly calling, Hebrews 3 1. I am chosen and have royalty in my veins, 1 Peter 2 9. I am designed for good works, Ephesians 2 16. I am a co heir with Christ, Romans 8 17. I am chosen by God to produce fruit. There's so many things that the scriptures and God declares about us that are just fascinating. We're fascinating creatures. <laughs> we are fascinating. Like the way that God made us, it's pretty ridiculous who he says that we are. And if we, in this identity message, in this identity sermon series, and really our life, I, I, I truly believe this, that if we learn who we are, we'll never want to be anybody else. And I want to give you two quick things just at the beginning of this that I think are paramount or really important that as we discover who we are, there's two foundations that we have to build this upon. One is love. This is a love game. This is a love reality. It's not for love, it's from love. It's learning who I am and who God says that I am from a place of love. The second is, is that identity is a gift. Identity is a gift that I receive by faith. It's not a reward that I earn by my works. Identity is a gift that I receive. It's not something that I earn by my behavior, by my rewards, but it's actually a free gift. This gift of righteousness is something that he gives to us. And my hope is today that as I share, that we learn about this beautiful thing that's called the righteousness of God. Because there is so much love and faithfulness in it by what he's done for us. In Romans, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do the best I can to work through this. But I want to lay a foundation here because I think the, the foundation of our identity is actually God's righteousness. It's who he says that we are. In Romans, uh, this is Paul wrote this letter pretty late in his career. And uh, before he had, he had written this letter, the Rome, from my understanding, had expelled all the Jews from Rome. And, and, and when he, at the time of writing this letter, all the Jews had come back. They'd come back to Rome, and they'd come back to their synagogues, and now all of a sudden you have these new believers in Christ, and really the church is divided. They're debating about what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat, should we be circumcised, should we not be circumcised, and, and it's really this big kind of debate and there's a divided church that's going on and, it, and you kind of see this if you read Romans 1, 2, and 3 you'll see that Paul I think there's three different groups that Paul is writing to in this letter and he's, he's really bringing the gospel and he's and one of the, the fruits of the gospel is it unifies us all 
The beautiful thing about the gospel is that this message is for everybody. This gospel is for all creation. There's nobody that's left out. There's nobody that didn't make the team. Every single one of us, Jesus died for all of us. And this gospel of Jesus Christ actually unifies us. And I want to I read this in, in Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Is, I'm going to start there. And I want to read this. <clears throat> so Romans 1, 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for it is the righteousness, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So listen to this, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Again, right, the righteousness of God is not something I define, it's something that's revealed. The righteousness of God, where is it revealed? It's revealed in this gospel. So God is revealing in the gospel, in his great work, he's revealing his righteousness. And again, this is not something that I go and make up my own. And if, even as you read through Romans, you'll see that the, the people in the, in the scriptures Paul's writing to, some of them started to form their own righteousness. And we're going to get into that in just a second. But the reality is, is that it's in this gospel, it's in this beautiful message of Jesus, it's in this him coming to the earth and dying on the cross and being resurrected and demonstrating his kingdom. It's in that, that he is revealing his righteousness. And it says that it's by faith, that, it, that this is a faith journey that we're going on in this walk with God. So there's, there's three groups of people here that I want to talk about. <clears throat> but before I do that, I want to just try to give a little definition to what righteousness is. If you look up a, a very simple theological term, it'll stay, say the state of him as he ought to be, which I think is a, a good definition of righteousness when he's talking about us, that we're at the state of ourselves as we ought to be. It's the condition acceptable to God. So righteousness for us would be the, the condition acceptable to God. But I want to talk for a second about God's righteousness, because we see this throughout the scripture. When you, when you think about Adam and Eve, what happened with Adam and Eve? They sinned, they disobeyed God, and they were exiled. There was an exile. When you think about Israel, God makes this covenant with Israel, and they, they miss the mark. They don't hold up their end of the, of the deal. And what happens? There's exile because of that. There's this, you know, in, in our, our day, a lot of times what we'll say is there's this separation that happens between God and the people. But guess what? God was faithful to his covenants. God was faithful. God didn't uphold his end of the deal in his covenant with Israel. God actually was faithful in that. And even Adam and Eve and all of humanity, God has been faithful to us. And Jesus, and it says this in a minute, it says that God actually demonstrated his righteousness through this gospel, through Jesus. So this, if you think about this, like God so loved us and was so faithful to us that even though really Adam and Eve, all of humanity is really wrapped up in that, even though they missed the mark, even though Israel missed the mark, and even though we all miss the mark, you know what? God's faithfulness never stopped towards us. God never, his faithfulness, his, his righteousness. And I think when you, when you read this in Romans, if you go and kind of unpack this, one of the things that you'll see in there is that God's faithfulness is, re, is revealed in his righteousness. That he never stopped pursuing us. And that this is totally revealed. So what happens when Jesus comes, because it was sin and disobedience that caused the exile, what does Jesus do? He deals with the sin. He deals with our sin. He deals with that, and he actually even removes the charge of our sin. And what does he do? He brings us back into right standing with him. And this is what the righteousness of God is. It's a demonstration of his faithfulness to you. It's his demonstration of his love for us. 
that even though we were exiled, even though that we walked away, God continually pursued us so much so that he sent his only son, the thing that meant the most to him, he sent him to earth to demonstrate his righteousness and his love for us. And not only that, he paid the price for us so that we could be brought back in, so that our status could change and we could be accepted and acceptable to God. So that it says in the scriptures that we have peace with him now. And what's amazing about this is this has nothing to do with our ability, our own effort, or anything that we did. It's just a revelation of his righteousness and his goodness towards us. Like, isn't that amazing? Like how much he loves us and he never gave up on humanity and his righteousness reveals his faithfulness to us. That no matter what we did, no matter what we've done, we all can come before God and we, our relationship with him has been restored. All of us, the charges of sin have been removed and we all can stand before God and be restored in relationship with him in peace. You know what that means? That means that I don't have to have a guilt conscious. That doesn't mean that I have to have a condemnation conscious. It doesn't mean that I have to live in shame and think that way about myself. It means that I can love me. It means that I can love me because God loves me. It means that I can be forgiven of my sins and they're washed away and I'm in right standing and fellowship with with God. So now what does it say? We can boldly become before God because of what he did, which is just amazing. And that is the foundation. This is the foundation of our identity with him. This is where we start. I even would say it's where we finish. It's just where we are, that we have been made right. And it was God's righteousness that was revealed to us. Come on, Jesus. So listen to this. There's a few people here. I'll read them real quick. There's, there's three different groups here that I think in Romans. Romans 1.18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men. It is interesting there. I'm not going to dive into that. It actually says the ungodliness. So what's God's wrath towards? It's actually ungodliness. It's sin. Who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I just, I, what I love about the Bible is so much when you, when you read this, you know, and this was what, written almost 2,000 years ago. So much of what we're reading right now is a great commentary on the culture that we live in today. Like this right here. I mean, you couldn't probably write this up better because truth is just timeless. There's just truth that's in this that, I mean, if you said it 2,000 years ago, 500 years ago today, or you say it in 1,000 years, these truths are just timeless. Come on. Um, for the, so it says, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I tell you what, that, that is um, a, a commentary on our culture today. Who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Get a little simple. <clears throat> being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into the image made like man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You can go on there and read, and it talks about the fruit of that. So what did they do? They took the image of God. They took his image and were made in the image of God, and they changed it for the image of man. They took the image of God and instead of his righteousness and who he is and let him define that, they began to find that themselves. And if you look at that, what happens is their thinking becomes nonsense, becomes irrational, and they end up, and I, I like the language that it uses there, is it takes things and it says things that were wise it, be, they, it becomes foolishness. They say things that are, that they act like things are wise. In my language, I would say they call good, bad, and bad good. 
and it just becomes confusion. And you just see the confusion that happens when we as humans put man at the center instead of God at the center. And when we do that, what happens is there's just confusion. And <clears throat> what's interesting is if you go on to read this, again, think about it. Paul here is actually writing to the Roman church. So he's writing to believers. He's writing to people that are in the church, in the house. And there's another group of people that he goes on and writes about. And it's in chapter 2, and for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just kind of paraphrase it. But he talks about these people are the ones that are actually judging the people that are suppressing the truth. And he talks about how these folks are the ones that have become and sit in the judge seat. And he pretty much goes on to tell them that, you know, why do you judge them when in some ways you still live the same way? And why do you become the judge and step into that judge seat? And <clears throat> how many of you know that's not a good idea? How many of you know it's not a good idea for us? And Paul, he's, he's driving somewhere as he does this. And the third group, just for the sake of time, I won't read it, but if you go there, it would be in Romans 2, 17. And he starts to talk about the Jews. And he's like, you guys are the ones that are the teachers of the law. You're the ones that know the law, but in a way you're teaching it, but you're not living it. And you've become the ones that you, you have, maybe you have the right message, but you aren't living with the right heart. And <clears throat> which is fascinating. And you could get into all three of these different groups. And, and I, I have a feeling if you're honest with yourself, you can find yourself in one of those that you probably can relate that either maybe I am, maybe I'm suppressing the truth and I've began to define who God is instead of letting him define me and really surrendering to who he is and who he says that I am, which again is gonna be the best version, purest version of yourself. Maybe I've, I've if we look at culture today, um, maybe we're the ones that have stepped into the judge seat. I'll say this about where we are in society. We have to learn to pre-love, not pre-judge. We have to learn to pre-love, not pre-judge. Look, there's a lot of things in society right now that, that are, are hard for me, that are frustrating, that are challenging. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of things that are pressed on us. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of people that are struggling with their identity. There's a lot of people that um, because, and, and we, we could get into all the reasons why, and there are reasons why, but there's a lot of people. I mean, when I was a kid, the question wasn't, who am I? The question is, what is my purpose? But today, the question is, is who am I? The question is, people are trying to figure out, and I think a lot of times because of the broken down of family, the fatherlessness, motherlessness, all of these things, we, we've lost our identity and who God says that we are. And what happens is, is that when I don't believe the truth, I empower a lie. And I end up living in something that's an illusion instead of something that's actually true and who God says that I am. And us as the body of Christ, we can't judge and condemn people, but we need to learn to love them and then teach them who God says that they are. Because the, the reality is, is, Masculinity is made in the image of God. Femininity is made in the image of God. And our, guess what? Masculinity, I know there's unhealthy people, but in its truest form is not toxic. Masculinity is not toxic. In God's eyes, masculinity is something that the world needs. It's actually a part of who God is. Femininity shouldn't be oppressed. Femininity is actually should be empowered. It should be, um, it's a, a part of, like, think about it. We're made in the image of God. So what is that? Male and female. And, and the truth is, is if you were born a male or a female, you're made in the image of God. And there's no need to change that. There's no, like, it is actually beautiful. It is actually amazing 
Like you have a purpose. You are made in the image of God. And this is the way God actually formed you, thought about you before you were born in the womb. He fashioned you and made you, and you are a beautiful creation. You are something that is that the world needs. And as we discover who God is and who he says that we are, we actually become the truest, best versions, most purposeful, powerful person in our lives. And that's what we want to do is learn who we are. Learn who God says that we are. And not begin to define that, honestly, a lot of times from a place of shame and pain and trauma, but actually learn and discover who God says that we are. And that comes from a place of so much love. Come on. Y'all doing all right? Here's where Paul drives. Here's the deal. You got the people that are living in this pagan kind of Hellenistic worldview, kind of where they remove God and man is at the center. Then you've got the judge, which honestly, a lot of times we can step into that. We start thinking that we're the judge. Guess what? Jesus doesn't need any help. God doesn't need any help. He can judge just fine. And and then you have the, the Jews And so you've got these three different groups of people. And and here's where Paul goes. And I love this, and I'll read this. I'm going to just paraphrase. In in Romans 3, he says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. We We have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. He goes and says this, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that who understand. And so he goes into this whole, whole thing about this. And then he runs towards what is beautiful in verse 21. And I want to read this. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Again, here's that word. I love that, that Paul uses that, that this is something that is revealed. This is something that is, you look up that word, it's to uncover it. He, God is revealing who he is. <clears throat> Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've heard so many messages that stop right there. Guess what? We, I think Paul is making a crazy awesome point here that we've all missed the mark. doesn't matter if we're living in the pagan, suppressing the truth, doing that thing. If we're the judge, if we're the Jew, he's making us all, he's saying it all that we have all missed the mark. Every single one of us has missed the mark. Thank God he doesn't stop there. And I think a lot of, yeah, so he, he keeps going for all have fallen short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Come on. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to, here's what he did, to demonstrate his righteousness. So again, this gospel, he is demonstrating his righteousness because in his forbearance, think about this, God passed over the sins. So here's how much God, he is showing us his faithfulness to the covenant and his faithfulness to us that he even passed over previous sins. And he demonstrated his righteousness because in the forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You know what it means when you've been justified? It means that you've been declared righteous. Every single one of us through faith in Christ has been declared righteous. Isn't that amazing? That we get to take on his faithfulness. We get to take on his, his attributes, his character, and that not only, I think a lot of what that refers to is that our sins, no matter what bucket we're in, no matter what person we are, our sins have been forgiven. The charges of sin have been removed. And now I am in right standing with God and I have peace with him. That my relationship with him has been restored. That I would say it like this, that my identity in him is secure. Like I am secure because of, it's not based on my own effort or my own works, but it's based on what he did. And so my identity in him is secure. I'll just give you some things that I think this righteousness does. It restores our standing before God. Again, there's no sense of guilt, no sense of sin, no sense of condemnation. There's, there shouldn't be an inferior complex. 
Like I am valued. I am loved. And I don't have to live by shame anymore. My fellowship is restored. Peace is restored. You know what else is restored? Freedom. You're free from sin. And I'm free to be who God has called me to be. Like that, that's just amazing. And our identity is secure in him. So I, I think in this message of us learning to live out of our identity and us doing this as a community, one of our big core values is this, is that we would learn who God says that all, we are. I think one of the main things, if there's a message of God's righteousness, it's his love for you. It's his love for us. And we get to live because of what Jesus has done. We get to live from love, not for it. Like every single one of us, you know, the more you discover who you are, the more you learn about God's righteousness, the more that I understand who he is and who I am, the more loved I'm going to feel. The more reality of God's love am I going to live in where I am not listening to a voice of shame anymore in my life. There's not a self-critic inside of me that's speaking and trying to partner with the voice of shame, but it's the voice of love that is actually building me up, encouraging me, and helping me become who God has called me to be. And that even if, and I'm going to get into this in a few weeks, I'm going to talk about the difference between, uh, because it uh, might be a newsflash, but the reality is, is that we were sinners. We're not actually sinners anymore in Christ. Like we're not, that, was a, that was actually part of this righteousness deal, is that when Paul says, when you consider yourself, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. When you compute yourself, you look up that word consider, it talks about like computing, or when you tally up who you are, when you think about whoever you are, it says to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Like this is who God says that we are. This is part of this deal of us understanding the righteousness of God. And that right there, that message right there changed my life. That message right there changed every bit. I mean, that message maybe more than any other message. When I heard that, because I'd walked so long thinking that I'm just a filthy old beat up, rusty, ragged, whatever, sinner. And that's just how I saw myself. But when I started to change that perspective and see myself the way God sees me, you know what it did? It actually empowered me to overcome sin. You know what it did? It actually helped me get some footing of like, I don't have to keep trying to work this, beat myself up, do all these things, but I actually can learn to live from love. Did I have to confront sin in my life? Yes. Did I have to learn how to overcome it? Yes. But I began to see myself the way God saw me and it actually empowered me to be who he has called me to be. And so that's this righteousness. And this righteousness, the amazing thing is, is there's no room for pride. <laughs> there's no room for pride. You don't know why? Because we had nothing to do with it. <laughs> All we did was believe. And if you think about it, if you are righteous, is God prideful? It's the righteousness of God. There's not pride in God. So actually me saying that I am the righteousness of God is saying I'm not prideful. <laughs> because that's not who he is. I'm actually taking on something that he is. I'm taking on humility. I'm taking on who he says that I am. And Paul, that's why I think Paul goes on to say that. He's like, there's no room for boasting for any of you. Doesn't matter if you're the Jew, the judge, or living in this pagan thought process. There's no room for pride because you've all sinned, but you've all been made righteous because of my faithfulness to you. Because of my covenant faithfulness to you. If you can, can you stand with me? I'm going to have our prayer team come up. We, is Christine in here? We talked about having the kids come up and pray today with us as well. If they're here, you may have a kid pray with you. But if you're a prayer servant, you can come on up. I'm going to have Erica come up. Let me just do this. I just want to pray over you. Holy Spirit, God, I pray that we would learn who you say that we are. God, I pray that we wouldn't be afraid of the righteousness of God, but we would understand that it is your covenant faithfulness to us, that it is your love for us. And Father, I pray that we would further understand who you say that we are and that we would discover the righteousness of God and that that verse that says, he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. 
that God, because of faith, every single one of us, Lord, when we believe in faith, God, we're in right relationship with you. Our relationship has been restored. God, we don't have to come to you being scared or afraid or from shame, but God, we can come boldly before you because of the work that you did on the cross. And God, I pray that this would get instilled in our way of thinking, in our emotions, in all of our being. Father, I pray that we would see ourselves and even think the right way about us, the way you see us. So Father, I pray for that over us in Jesus' name. Amen.